Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm going to introduce the topic of surgery for neuroendocrine tumors. I have no disclosures. These are just some of the learning objectives. We're just gonna talk a little bit today about surgery for localized neuroendocrine tumors and then the role of surgery for metastatic neuroendocrine tumors. Oh, thank you. Um, I, we've learned a lot today about nets, the classification, how we describe nets, um, and a lot of the tools in our toolkit for the treatment of neuroendocrine tumors. And this slide just illustrates a couple of the ways that we talk about neuroendocrine tumors. So under that category of neuroendocrine neoplasms that Dr. Uh, Thor uh, discussed uh, earlier this morning, we can talk about nets as being functional or non-functional. Um, we can talk about nets in terms of their site of origin, where they are, if they arise from the foregut, which includes our esophagus, pulmonary, duodenal, and pancreas nets, or whether they arise from the midgut or hindgut. And then, of course, our pathological description of neuroendocrine tumors. So many different ways that we can talk about neuroendocrine neoplasms. Neuroendocrine uh, tumors, as you all know, are on the rise. Compared to other cancers, this graph illustrates that while all other cancers seem to be staying, uh, for the most part, stable, we're seeing a pretty progressive increase in neuroendocrine tumor incidence. It's now the second most prevalent GI cancer after colorectal. This illustrates that the incidence of NETs are uh, increasing across all primary tumor sites. So that includes lung, small bowel, rectal, and pancreas nets, and then the others are listed um, as well. The increase in nets is also being seen across all stages and all grades of tumors, which is illustrated in the graphic below. Part of the reason why we're seeing more and more nets diagnosed is, while we're, we're more aware of them, our physicians are more aware of nets and keeping them in the differential diagnosis when our patients come to clinic, a large part of that is because of groups like you all raising awareness and also our patient advocates. There have been improvements in the way that we describe nets. There's more frequent CT scans being done. Uh, it seems like nowadays you can't go into an emergency room without getting a CT scan. And so we're, we're picking up these uh, tumors uh, more frequently. The role of surgery for localized disease is fairly straightforward. So surgery offers really the only chance of cure for localized nets. And when we're talking about curative surgery, we're, what we mean is that there should be really no evidence of disease left behind after the operation. So whether that means that a tumor located in a portion of the pancreas is removed or a small uh, nodule along the, or on the adrenal gland, which is uh, also called our pheochromocytoma. Whether we're removing that, it's being removed in its entirety with no tissue or no cancer left behind. Uh, we do recommend surgery for all uh, hormonally secreting tumors. So some small neuroendocrine tumors of the pancreas, for example, they have a benign or very slow growing course, but if they're producing some of those hormones that Dr. Del Rivero mentioned and they're causing these terrible symptoms, we recommend removal. Um, even though we talk about cure and we talk about no cancer being left behind after surgery, patients should still undergo long-term surveillance because as many of you know, the recurrence can, can happen really at any time, five years down the road, 10 years down the road, and we certainly don't want to miss that. So just a little bit more detail about pancreatic uh, neuroendocrine tumors and the role of surgery for localized disease. There are three general categories of operations that we can perform. 
For some of those very slow growing small tumors that don't have a cancerous or um, a cancerous potential or potential of spread, um, we can perform enucleation procedures. This is generally reserved for the insulinomas, very small insulinomas. Uh, more often than not, we're Patients may undergo a, what's called a Whipple procedure or a distal pancreatectomy. So Whipple procedure is generally reserved for tumors that are located in what's called the head of the pancreas. And does this have a pointer? Yeah. yeah. <coughs> oh, here we go. Um, so the head of the pancreas is located here. And this area can be very tricky because it does, it is part of a really a major highway system for our GI tract where all of our, our stomach content, our pancreatic juices, and our biliary juices all empty into this area of the intestine called the duodenum. And so for a Whipple procedure, this section of the um, intestine and pancreas is removed and reconstructed. So very high risk, surgical risk operation. And if a neuroendocrine tumor is sitting in that location, that is, that is the surgery that is going to be offered. Whereas for a distal pancreatectomy, this is for our tumors that are located in what's called the tail. If you think about the pancreas as a fish, um, this is considered the head, the body, and the tail of the pancreas. And so if a tumor is located in that tail region, it can be removed with or without the spleen, which is located nearby. In general, um, op observation of small non-functioning neuroendocrine tumors can be considered, but once these tumors are larger than two centimeters or of any size with function, we recommend removal. Um, we do want to take into account uh, risk factors for surgery, risk factors for general anesthesia, the patient's wishes, of course, and the behavior of the tumor. The role of surgery for localized gastrointestinal nets is generally surgery. So uh, patients can present with nonspecific abdominal complaints, obstructive symptoms, um, no symptoms at all. It may get picked up incidentally on one of those CT scans. Um, there can be a number of symptoms that may clue us in to patients having a GI net. In surgery, we want to do a thorough examination of the abdominal cavity, look for any other sites of disease. Um, if there are any sites, it can often be removed at the same time as that small bowel tumor is being removed. Um, we want to keep in mind that small bowel neuroendocrine tumors can all, often be mul multiple, multifocal, and so careful palpation of that intestine really from the end of the um, esophagus all the way down should be examined thoroughly to make sure that there are no other small bowel sites. Um, the uh, operation is generally resection of that, uh, that portion of the small bowel as well as the lymph node draining that portion of the small bowel. And this, um, this graphic here just illustrates um, some of the classic appearance a neuroendocrine tumor can have. This is actually calcification within the mesentery, so that uh, drainage system of the uh, intestine. The lymphatics and the vessels are located in this tissue called the mesentery, and patients can develop large bulky lymph nodes. They can have calcifications that appear white on imaging, and so that's what we're seeing here. Um, this is a patient of mine who presented with a bowel obstruction emergently and I happened to be the surgeon on call. And um, in our efforts to relieve uh, the obstruction, we noticed a small, um, small tumor uh, that was palpable within the bowel and fortunately had not spread to other sites on examination. And then this is just a graphic, just illustrating um, you know, maybe a little bit more clearly how you can have this small bowel neuroendocrine tumor affecting this section of the bowel that's being removed. And then this is that mesentery, which holds the network of the blood supply and lymphatic drainage. 
Now, the role of surgery in uh, patients with metastatic disease is a little bit more complex. And for many of the reasons that you've learned today, there are many, many treatments that we now have to treat neuroendocrine tumors that have spread to the liver and other sites. So why is treating uh, neuroendocrine liver metastasis important? Well, as you know, distant metastases can present in many patients in up to 30 to 60% of cases. The liver is the most common site of distant metastases, and liver failure due to overwhelming liver tumor burden is the primary cause of mortality. So a lot of our focus on uh, drug development, treatment, and patient outcomes is directed towards treating the liver. And one of those uh, tools that we have is surgery. And therefore, it makes sense that the presence of liver metastases and the amount of liver tumor burden that a patient may have will impact survival. Uh, when we're talking about surgery for liver metastases, there are many different types of operations. Um, the uh, surgical cytoreduction is a term that we use to include procedures like enucleations, um, debulking procedures where we're removing a lot of the bulk, any uh, evidence of tumor that we can see um, on visual inspection in, at the time of the surgery. And we can use a combination of techniques. We can use ablative procedure where we're really burning that tumor and killing it. We can enucleate it or scoop it out and preserve all the healthy tissue behind. Or we can perform wedge resections where you're removing just a rim of healthy tissue along with the tumor in order to remove it. And depending on where the tumor is located, um, it would be amenable to one of these techniques generally. Uh, there can also be anatomic liver resections, depending on the location of the tumor. If it's by uh, the main drainage system or blood supply of the liver, uh, a wedge resection or coring out that tumor may not be feasible. And so maybe an anatomic resection where you have to take care of the blood supply, the drainage system of the liver might be required. And then um, another uh, aspect of surgical care also includes liver transplant, which I'll touch on a little bit later in the talk. So when we're thinking about surgical cytoreduction for patients, a few of the um, preoperative considerations. The, the big question is, what is the goal of the surgery? And so there's you know, three different um, kind of buckets or top ways that I think of uh, when we're meeting a patient and talking about surgery. And we have to ask, is the goal of the operation a survival benefit? Are we trying to clear all of that tumor from the liver in hopes that we can prolong progression-free survival, pro prolong overall survival? Are we recommending surgery for hormonal control? So patients who have a lot of tumor bulk that uh, are releasing hormones, they can be really suffering from carcinoid syndrome and some of the other hormonally um, active syndromes that we talked about earlier in the day, and removing a lot of that tumor bulk has been, uh, has been found to have symptom uh, improvement for patients. So that can be a big goal for surgery. Or is surgery being done for palliation? Maybe the location of a particular tumor is causing pain or uh, is causing obstruction. Um, and so you know, th that might be a goal of surgery. So these are, you know, very different um, goals of uh, surgical treatment and things that we have to keep in mind when um, the patient is coming in for a surgical consultation. This um, graphic here on the side just really, oh, I jumped past it, just I think really nicely illustrates the collaborative uh, process between our multidisciplinary teams, and then of course the key role that the patient plays in determining next steps in their care. Oh, did I skip it again? Yes. So surgical cytoreduction. Um, with all of our operations, beginning with a thorough inspection of the abdominal cavity, just to make sure that our, what we went into surgery thinking where the disease is is actually what we're seeing. 
a lot of times the um, scan can underestimate the burden of the disease um, when you're actually in the operation. And so a thorough exam of the abdominal cavity, the peritoneal lining, looking for any metastatic implants um, or other sites of metastatic disease. We, if the uh, patient still has their primary tumor, it can often be resected at the same time as the metastatic disease. And so we like to perform one operation if it's safe to do so. With some pancre pancreatic operations, it, it may be better to stage the patient because they may be at risk of infections or other complications. And, um, and so it becomes a little bit patient and um, tumor specific. The uh, other adjuncts that we have to help uh, reduce the bulk and uh, burden of disease, we talked about microwave ablation, parenchymal sparing uh, resections, which are also called enucleations, where we're scooping out that tumor, but preserving all of the healthy tumor, um, and then liver ultrasound to help identify the location of those tumors. Um, I mentioned uh, briefly, we can talk about removal of the primary tumor at the same operation or perhaps a stage operation. And there's a number of factors that may come into play in making that decision. There's also a number of different approaches to surgery. Um, so there's open techniques that might be indicated versus robotic versus laparoscopic. And a lot of that um, will depend on the uh, location of the tumor um, and other patient factors. So what does that, what, what does it sort of look like in the OR? Well, just before we get to the OR, we, we want to do as much mapping of the liver and any um, metastatic sites um, that we can find ahead of time. And so that will involve typically cross-sectional imaging with um, CT scans or MRIs. Um, the patient will have a PET DOTA tape, and you can see here that we're able to identify, you know, where in the liver are the lesions. After this, in the operating room, we try and find where those tumors are, correlating with our preoperative imaging and keeping track of each tumor to make sure that we have removed all of the ones that we can see, feel, and identify with ultrasound. And then what we're left with is hopefully this healthy liver. This is all the healthy liver here. And then these, these areas are where tumor has been resected. Liver, plant, liver transplant does have a role in the management of neuroendocrine liver metastases um, in general. For patients that have demonstrated some disease stability, um, for our well-differentiated nets generally, um, patients who've already had their primary tumor removed and don't have a lot of don't have disease outside of the liver, um, there's a criteria for uh, liver transplant in uh, cancer patients called the Milan criteria, and that's generally what transplant surgeons will follow. Um, and can be uh, one of the tools that we have for neuroendocrine liver metastases. The role of surgery for high-grade nets, for high-grade um, G3 neuroendocrine tumors that are localized, certainly surgery if the um, tumor can be removed in its entirety. We're generally not performing those enucleation procedures for these patients. We want to remove um, the, the tumor, it's in entirety, so we're not doing a lot of that, the scooping that we talked about where you're taking out the tumor and leaving the healthy tissue behind. Here we're performing more of those oncologic resections um, the, uh, for localized disease. They do have a higher risk of recurrence, so we have to very carefully follow patients after surgery. Um, for metastatic disease, um, debulking de is, uh, is an option, but we do want to um, carefully discuss all of the treatment options for these patients because we do know that the recurrence is going to be high. Uh, this uh, graphic, uh, really nice, just, you don't have to, you know, read through all of this, but I just like how it um, illustrates 
just the just the number of treatment options that we have for patients with GI and pancreatic G3 NEDs. So for localized disease, we talked about surgery. Um, for metastatic disease, there's a number of different therapies and it, you know, a number of different therapies that are coming down the pipe. For neuroendocrine carcinoma, surgery doesn't really play a role for metastatic disease. For localized disease, there may be a rationale for patients that you know, uniquely have been excellent responders, um, have shown some disease stability, but generally um, these patients are being treated very aggressively with other treatment modalities that work better. So in conclusion, just some of the things, just some of the highlights. So surgery for localized disease is the recommendation. We want to remove um, all evidence of disease. Uh, even though we use the word cure, we, uh, we want to keep following patients and making sure that we are um, carefully assessing them for recurrence. Um, a as you can tell with all of the number of treatment options, a personalized approach uh, is necessary for each patient. Um, surgery can be performed for those three big categories that we talked about. We may be looking for a survival benefit. It might be for palliation if patients are symptomatic and patients may be symptomatic from hormone excess. So that might be a third reason. Keep in mind that surgery is just one of the many treatment options and really requires that multidisciplinary team, which includes you, in determining what is the best course of treatment. And I just wanted to thank you all for having me today, and thank you, NCAM.